The Tim Hill Podcasts. Ordinary people's extraordinary stories. Welcome to the Tim Hill Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to have a chat with Kevin. Kevin's going to tell us where and when he was born. He's going to describe what it was like where he grew up, the schools he went to, and the education that he received. So, Kevin, you're in the room. Okay, hi. So I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, here in the United States. And uh, my education, of course, I went through high school, and then I studied uh, voice at Bryn Mawr Conservatory of Music in Pennsylvania. Right. So yeah. you've gone from <laughs> you've gone from kindergarten to, <laughs> to leaving university. Yeah, so, well, you know, you, you have the elementary yeah. school and the high school and so forth and yeah. so on. So can we have a look at that then? So what was your um, your kindergarten like? Can you remember back that far? I really can't. That was a long time ago. Uh, my elementary school, uh, there was a librarian who was musical. And since I was musical, we became buddies. Mm -hmm. uh, junior high school was nothing that impressed me much. High school was a typical high school, though I was making recordings at that time, so I was more involved in my music career. And oh. um, then I, I naturally got into studying uh, voice uh, at the Bryn Mawr Conservatory of Music after high school. Yeah. All right, okay. So what was the area like in Philadelphia that you grew up in? Well, Philly's a, a city, um, and uh, it's a typical city. Uh, it was very nice. It was on the east coast of the United States. Uh, nothing that really stands out about it. Well, I, I think there's one thing I, I know. Um, there's a couple of things I know about Philadelphia. Um, apart from the, the Eagles, um, Rocky was done there. The film Rocky, when, you know, when running up them stairs and punching the air and all that. So that's that was in Philadelphia. Um my daughter, oh, way back in 19, 1990, thereabouts, she came over to America and she was in Philadelphia for, for, for a year doing uh, exchange student. So she, she was over there doing that for a year in Philadelphia. So, yeah. So did you see any of the film filming when it was going on? Were you part of the, the background audience when... When no. he was doing his bit on the stairs and stuff? No, no. I just knew it was filmed in Philadelphia. And uh, I was involved in the folk music scene, the Philadelphia Folk Festival. Uh, but uh, that was about it. I mean, it was a pleasant enough city to be in. Not as pretty mm -hmm. as where I am now, but it did its job. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, let's let's skip through the the the, uh, the the elementary school and 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 starting at your junior high. So so your elementary school, you started picking up being uh, into music. Yes, I played piano. Okay, and 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 how did you start that? Did your parents get you into that? Um, did they, they force you into it as a youngster or? Or did you pick was, it up at school? I was just naturally gifted. I was musical. So though here's the whole education thing. In elementary school, I played piano around the age of third grade on through. I uh, became friendly with the elementary school librarian, and she played the guitar, so sometimes we would do jams. She introduced me to folk music in junior high school. Nothing much happened except I fell in love with Peter, Paul, and Mary as the folk singers. Uh, I continued to play piano. Nothing specifically. I don't even remember the name of the middle school. High school was at Unionville High School in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, which was a rural area. And again, nothing much significant there going on. I basically was developing my music career. Uh, around that time. I didn't play any sports, wasn't interested in school, was really only interested in my music career. Uh, graduated and then immediately went on the road. So there's really no significant education thing that stands out as 
uh, anything significant happened. I met my girlfriend in high school or none of that. It was just get through school, get into my music career. <laughs> and get, so get so did you, did you, you obviously graduated at high school then. Did you go on to, to a university and, and do a degree in music or, or, or just got out of high school and then um, went play music? I got out of high school and went and played music. Okay. What was the first gig you played? Can you remember that? Oh, it was probably an old age home because I was very young and those were the only people that would listen. They were half deaf, so it was probably a good idea. <laughs> And then eventually, uh, my first record came out on Folkway Records. I hadn't gotten into personal coaching, which is what I do now, of course, because I was too mm -hmm. young. But my music career started around the age of 16 with my first album of dulcimer music uh, on Folkway Records. Ah. So what instruments do you play other than the piano? I play the dulcimer, the mountain dulcimer. Oh, that's it. It's a... It look, looks like a bit like a guitar, but it or a, a fiddle. Yeah, it's like the painting behind me. That's a portrait of me, sort of playing a dulcimer. Ah, and does it make a, a, a particularly unique sound? It sounds a cross between a guitar and a harp. Hmm. And, and so you you play it with a with your fingers rather than a bow. Yes, you play it just like a guitar, except on your lap. Ah. So how long did it take you to learn to play that? I learned very quickly. I taught myself. I developed my own style on it. And uh, I saw one at a party somewhere. And then I uh, found one and started to teach myself to play it. Uh, and, yeah. yeah. So obviously, with your um, piano background, you can read music. Is there, yeah. is there music actually written for it? There is music, but I sort of wrote my own on it, so I never paid attention to any of that. Mm. I sort of did my own thing. Excellent. So, going on the road then, let's have a think. So, what sort of uh, what sort of gigs were you playing? Was it was it all well, folk music? Back then, I was when playing you... folk clubs and folk festivals and any place that would pay me because I was young. Uh, and then eventually I got a booking agent and started to play concerts. And uh, it got bigger from there. Hmm. So what was the biggest venue you played at that time? When I was young, the biggest thing that happened to me musically is I got a record deal, a record contract, and I did a dozen records for Folkways Smithsonian Records. They're still available online at the Smithsonian. And, uh, you know, I guess the first big gig for me was the Philadelphia Folk Festival and then subsequently other festivals. I did a little bit of TV and... Uh, you know, folk clubs like that. Hmm. So the TV, what did that involve? Well, that was later in my career. That was around in my 30s. Uh, there was a television show called Shining Time Station, which was based on Thomas the Tank Engine. It was a children's show, and the producer had been putting his daughter to bed with my lullaby album, Lullabies for Little Dreamers. And he was putting together a show that was going to host Ringo Starr of the Beatles. So he asked if I would sing the theme to it. And I had been making some children's songs. So I sang the theme and it became a very big show all around the world. So my, my name got out there in, in the music field as the singer of the Shining Time Station theme. All right. <laughs> So did that involve playing the music at all, or playing, playing your instrument, or were you just doing the voice? And I then just, you had Ringo Starr bashing his drums in the background. I did. I just sang the theme to a soundtrack without Ringo, and I just sang the theme to the TV show. All right. And did you get to meet Ringo Starr at all? No. I never met anybody. <laughs> 
that's quite often the case, isn't it? Where, where you're doing a, a, a voice and then, and then the, the music track sort of put in after or, or beforehand and then you, you put in the overlay on it. Yeah, that... um, the show was done in New York City and I lived in Florida at the time, I think. All right. That's a bit of a commute then. So, yes, yeah. So did, how did that work? Did, did, did you do it over the uh, ISDN line or the internet? They brought me, they flew me up to New York City to a recording <laughs> studio and I recorded the song there. All right. That's that's kind of them. <laughs> All expenses played. Do you come up first class yeah, or yeah. <laughs> was it cattle class and <laughs> and a cheap taxi? <laughs> no, it was, they they treated me well. It was nice. It was mm. a good experience. And that's still going around now, is it? That that particular yeah, show. Yeah, it's on YouTube, I believe. All oh, right, I have to have a look out for that. So. Uh, what was the worst gig you played? Well, the worst gig I played was a festival in Virginia, and the stage was down a hill. And on top of the stage, there were a bunch of tents with crafts people. And apparently, there were two motorcycle gangs that came and got into a, a fight, and one man shot another guy and killed him. While I was performing, I just heard the pop of this of the guns, and mm. of course, that was the worst. You, you know, <laughs> can't get much worse than that. <laughs> so uh, that was uh, the worst. Well, I mean, it couldn't have been your music that upset them. Surely not. <laughs> I, w I would like to think not. No. <laughs> so, were you interviewed by the police? I mean, I mean did they? I mean the. the I think they, they taped the whole area off and, and no, the whole what happened is, thing got cancelled. Uh, when I found out what was going on, uh, they they called the police, but the police were quite a ways away. So I escaped, actually. I went uh, behind the stage and took my dulcimer and I ran to the performer's parking lot. And the gangs weren't letting anybody out because they, they really took over. But there was a field uh, behind my car, and I went driving over the bumpy field until I saw a road and then went on the road and then up the highway. And as I was driving out, a whole bunch of cop cars came whizzing by. So, yeah, that's what happened. All right. So, so you didn't sort of um, do the classic of the, the show must go on and carry on playing then? Well, you know, I didn't know what to do. Uh, I asked the stage manager, and he said, keep playing. And uh, I didn't know. I started to play a little bit, then someone yelled at me. They said, someone just got killed, and you're, you're continuing to play music. So I thought, you better get off the stage before someone shoots you. So mm. I did. I mean, I basically ran for my life. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so it's difficult to know what to do in that sort of situation. It's a fight, flight, or, <laughs> or stay still and, yeah. So that's, that's an experience then. That, that was the worst, yeah. Hmm. So what was your, what was your ultimate, what was the, been the absolute, the, the, the top of the tree, which was the, best thing that you've done well there was a folk music group called peter paul and mary that was world renowned yeah and of course they sang the song puff the magic dragon and leaving on a jet plane and i was friendly with them and i went backstage to see them before a concert and mary asked if i would perform a song during their concert which had only oh. been done once before so I did. I got to solo, and a friend of mine was there and actually took a photograph of it. I ha I still have. So that was, you know, if you're into rock and roll, imagine the Beatles inviting you on stage to solo one song. So yeah, that was, uh, that was a life changer for me. So you didn't get to play along with Puff the Magic Dragon. Well, I did a recording. That one. I did a recording of that song with Peter on one of my records. 
Dinosaurs oh. and Dragons, and I recorded with them over time, but that was the best uh, folk fest, uh, the best performance I had. Hmm. So where, where are you going now then? What's, what's your... Well, um... I'm a personal coach. So what I do is it, I help solve problems for people. So what they do is they come to me and I have a basic formula. So if you feel stressed or stuck in life or you want to start a career or get into or end a relationship, I have a certain formula that I develop it's sort of like a GPS system. So you come to me with a house structure, and then I show you how to fill in the rooms. And mm. I work with the dulcimer with that. My coaching site is uh, kevinroth.org, or you could email me at kevinroth.org at Gmail. And I became a life coach. And so that's what I'm doing now, combining a little bit of music. But I work, with mm -hmm. client, I work with doctors and lawyers and people from clergy, really people all over the world through Zoom or online mm -hmm. things. And uh, I, I help, them, uh, help them improve their life and find more joy. Brilliant. So how do you, how do you get in touch with these people in the first place? How Do they come to you? Uh, are you recommended by... Um, professionals uh, well they uh, find me, they find me they hear me on podcasts uh i word of mouth uh i have a doctor who recommends me to some of her patients um i have a lot of good reviews testimonials i have an online course on uh kevinroth.teachable.com so uh that's how people find me yeah hmm. So what would what would the typical person be that would come and use your services? Well, what it depends. Sort of... if, they, if they feel stress in their life, I help them work through their stress. A lot of people uh, aren't happy. So I help them discover what happy is for them and what how to give them a game plan about how to achieve those goals. So everyone has problems and I have the solution. Uh, hmm. It's something I developed from my own um, existential crisis back in 2016. And then I now teach what I did uh, to live a happy life. A lot of people, you know, they'll get self-help books or they'll try different things and they're temporary fixes. What I teach people to do is a, a technique that works every time if you'll use it. Hmm. So what was your problem back in 2016 then? What, what brought you to, to it? Well, as you know from reading the information that I sent you before, uh, I was diagnosed with stage three melanoma cancer and given only two years to live. So I, uh, I obviously didn't- You them wrong there then. Yeah, they were wrong but I changed the way I thought about my life. I created a different story in my head. And I said, I'm gonna go from uh, having cancer to not having cancer and from being almost bankrupt to getting myself on my feet and from being stressed to not being stressed and from being unhappy to happy. So over a period of two to three years, I uh, did a lot of research tried a few things and slowly they worked. And then when I became a life coach, I began to teach what I did to other people and saw that that worked for them too. Mm. So that's how I got into it. So what what treatment did you get for, for the cancer? I, mean, I got none. I have none because they there is no treatment for it. You, uh, got, you can't go down the road of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, all the normal sort of well uh, not for the kind of melanoma i had i mean i had uh, a little spot removed on my nose and a small lymph node but it was basically that there's no cure for it at the time especially now that we're talking mm -hmm. uh, because it had metastasized it was stage three so uh different doctors wanted to do different things but i listen to my gut and i teach people to listen to their gut 
And I didn't think that that was the right decision. So I finally found a oncologist that agreed with me. And he said, these things are not going to, there's a 2% chance they'll work and they're going to make me really, really sick. So I suggest you wait a year. There's a 70% chance it'll return and a 30% chance that it won't. And if it returns, it returns, and then we'll just treat you until you're dead. And if it doesn't, you're very, 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 very lucky. So I got very, 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 very lucky. Mm. A return. Extremely lucky. Well, that had to do with not just luck. It had to do with me changing my diet, uh, losing 30 pounds, because stress and inflammation causes illness. Yeah. And creating in my mind a vision of myself as healthy and successful and happy. And the doctors wanted me to have a vision of, <sighs> I'm dead. <laughs> so I basically told them where to shove it and mm -hmm. did some research on my own and found people that had cured themselves through different alternative measures and spoke with them and felt that that was my direction. I figured I had nothing to lose. I was either going to live or I was going to die. So I yeah. could get busy living or get busy dying. And that's a philosophy that I teach my clients. All of yeah. the workplace, I talk about this. Live every day as though it's your last. Because one day it will be. It's, it's, it's eking closer, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, that's the way I live. Every day is going to be my last. And, and if I get up in the morning, well, let's get on and do something. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think that's, that's a good philosophy to go on with. Yeah. It's, it's worked so far. I've managed to get out of bed most mornings. <laughs> so this is this is where you are at the moment then? That's so where I is... am at the moment. I live in San Diego, California. Uh, I live a bohemian kind of life. I make music. I'm writing a book about my coaching and my teaching. And I have clients. I have a free a session for people to talk with me for 30 minutes. And then if we get along and I think I can help you, which I'm sure I can, then we talk about you becoming a client. And you can get that free session on my website, kevinroth.org. Or now with uh, the Russia crap, uh, sometimes you can't get on the website because there's a lot of hacking. But you can write to me at kevinroth.org at gmail. And I'm sure you'll have a link on your podcast. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put that down in the description. I'll, yeah, I'll so, so people can reach out. Again. And it's absolutely free. And you just tell me what your what your problem is. And I, if I have a solution, I say, I think I can help you with this. And then we go from there. Yeah, I've, I've got a problem. <laughs> I don't have quite enough hours in the day <laughs> to get everything done. So... It goes on to the next day. The problem is that tomorrow never comes. <laughs> well, <laughs> today you run out of time. Yeah, you learn to prioritize. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I'm 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 enjoying myself, which is the main thing. That's it. I mean, I, I retired four years ago from the, the British Army, having done forty four years under the colours, and uh, and I'm I'm just having a ball nowadays. Um, Good. This is like almost a full-time job for me, but I don't really get paid for it. <laughs> I'll get the odd, the odd buck here and the odd dollar there, but it's a, it's, it's a pure, um, purely done for love, I think. Well, that's good. That's, um, you should love what you do and do what you love. Absolutely. So I'm not I'm not looking at making money out of it. I'm not looking at make, earning a living out of it. I mean, I, I can... I can just about scrape by on my pensions, but what I'm looking at mainly doing is leaving this legacy for future generations so they can look back and say, blimey, we've got it hard nowadays. <laughs> they had it easy good, back then. <laughs> good old Tim Hill, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Go, oh, he was a bloke and half, wasn't he? <laughs> so, uh, so there you go. That's the way I do things. Good. And uh, just as a, uh, we've got two aircraft carriers behind us, new ones. Mm. And uh, we've got one alongside at the moment. The other one's coming back tomorrow. Ah, oh, okay. So they've, 
to import tomorrow. <laughs> Just noticed today. Will they match your shirt? Just about. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about San Diego then. Well, San Diego is in Southern California. Uh, it's about 30 minutes north of Mexico. And it's absolutely beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful and expensive cities to live in in the United States. But we have the ocean. I'm about 15 minute drive from the ocean and a, about a 45 to 50 minute drive to the mountains. So I do a, a good bit of hiking. So I really mm -hmm. like to go both places. And the weather is absolutely beautiful year round. It's uh, mostly sunny, rarely rains because it's the desert. Food's so, great. so can you can you do that song then? What song? It never rains in Southern California. No, I don't. I don't know the words to that, but it, it's it's <laughs> a very pretty place. It's a kind of eclectic. Yeah, uh, a lot of museums. Everything you can eat outside all year long because it's you know the weather is really nice, uh, and it's a lovely place to be. Hmm. So do you have rain very often? Because it never rains in Southern California, or does it? Well, you know, we have a rainy season, and uh, I think that's around June. They call it the June gloom, but mm. it usually uh, is only that way in the mornings. And, um, and when, when, when we have rain, it's nice. You know, we're always... Uh, yeah. We always need more rain, but it's not nothing like um, back east in mm. Philadelphia where it rains and it snows and you have four seasons. So I'm about to take a trip from San Diego all the way up the West Coast to see, oh, yeah. um, see a lot of California that I haven't seen. Because this is around about, I think it's around about the time of the year that the, the whale migration is. Is it this time I'm of year? Not, I'm not sure. They're all heading north for the summer. Maybe. I mean, you can see it from the coast. Um, but you, you, you see pod after pod of um, whales all, all heading north to to the cull, the, the, the krill in, mm. in the um, of Alaska. But they, they, it was a big thing in, in California. Um, I forget which which bit is, I think it's a little bit further north from where you are, where you can actually see them. They go through this particular bay uh, and and the, it's, they almost guarantee it every year that the, the whales are doing a migration north. Hmm. Uh, you might catch that on your way up. Here's yeah. a bit of travel information for you. Yeah. <laughs> I ran into a young kid yesterday with his girlfriend and they had converted a van into a little mini home. Mm. They were traveling all over the country. They had just come from Arizona and now they were in San Diego for a while and they had their little stove and their dog and his guitar hanging up inside the van. And uh, a lot of people do that. They rent uh, campers and, you know, they yeah. go park to park. And, and and also a lot of people do it on motorbikes. Um, that's that's I think that's a classic motorbike road that that goes up the coast of South, uh, certainly Southern California. Yeah, I think it's called Route Sixty Six. Yeah, yeah, and then obviously you've got Route Sixty Six, which is the famous one that people come across on. Yeah, yeah. So have you done that? No, I haven't. Uh, but I probably will. I'm thinking I'm going to be going for two or three weeks. So uh, we'll see where I end up. Uh, I probably go probably close to Oregon. Um, but uh, I'm still in the planning stages. And how are you going to do it? You're going to you're going to drive or you're uh, you going to rent a camper van or you're going to do it on a motorbike? I'm going to drive because I'll bring a dulcimer and I have my little dog and some clothing and uh It'll be more expensive to stay in hotels, but at least I know um, yeah. I've got a clean shower and I'm not really much yeah. of a camper kind of guy. So 
but we'll find out, you know. Yeah. So, you, so <laughs> you're not you're not going to drive for, uh, almost non-stop then. <laughs> No, I drive about four four hours a day and then see things and find out where mm. some good hiking is, good restaurants, what are some good wineries and uh, some friends. Yeah, they, they, they've got a lot of um, um, vineyards in, in sort of California, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. They, they do produce quite a few few wines, I must say. Yeah, there's a lot of funky towns, a lot of good food and mm. uh, beautiful sights to see. Yeah, there's uh, there's San Francisco and the Golden Gate Bridge. You going to do that? Going to go over that? Well, I it. will. I think I've got to go over the bridge to get farther north. But I've been to San Francisco, so I probably won't stop there. Uh, hmm. I'll probably stop in places like Half Moon Bay and um, uh, Montecito. I heard is beautiful. I'll be going to a, a place called Ojai, California. But I'll skip the main. I don't like major things like L.A., San Francisco. Mm. I like quirky, funky, little out of the way places. And you looking at playing any gigs on the way up? You know, I'm not because I don't want it to be a working thing. Uh, I want to just kind of go when I go. I'll have my computer with me so I can continue to do uh, talking with my clients. Mm. But um, I don't want to schedule. Um, and I don't want to even know where I'm going the next day. I'm, when I get in the car, I hit the gas and I go. And then when I stop, I stop. Find, find a motel on the way, is it? Uh, do hotel, a booking.com. Yeah. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Something clean and cheap, hopefully. <laughs> is anything cheap nowadays? No. 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 But uh, I think this is a once. Uh, in a lifetime trip for me because if mm -hmm. I did book concerts or things like that I would have to be at a certain place at a certain time and, yeah, and then uh, you're on a schedule then and... yeah then I probably have to fly there this I just want to get in my car and go just meander meander oh, as the Australian psych I walk about yes <laughs> Just is go that, do, that just go are? walk around, mate. Are you in Australia? No, I'm in England. That's what I thought. I was just spoke with someone else, another person who does a podcast from Australia. Yeah, yeah. nice. Yeah. nice. Yeah. So I'm in England. Uh, I brought brought up in England. Um, I was brought up just north of London. I was born just outside of London, and um, but I spent 44 years under the under the colours in the British Army. So I've been around the block a time or two. And now I live <laughs> in a naval town. <laughs> mm. Well, you know, that's interesting because San Diego is a naval town. Mm. Uh, they have a thing on the Coronado Beach. Oh, you can go there and all the Navy boats and the planes and a uh, big Navy town here. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you see one of those two uh, turn up there one day. That's uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS um, Prince of Wales, mm. uh, the British new two uh, aircraft carriers. And so Queen Elizabeth was out in the uh, in the Far East last year, uh, winding up the Chinese a bit, I think. Uh, and so Prince of Wales is just just on her way back from Norway. Mm. She's been up in Norway for for the last. Um, few weeks or a couple mm. of months supporting the the winter exercise in Norway. So, mm. but she's due back in tomorrow, apparently. Okay, well, give her my regards. I will do. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kevin, I've really enjoyed the chat with you. Yeah, I've enjoyed being on your show and chatting with you. And uh, um, if you come to San Diego, let me know. Will do. So there, there, there may be plans afoot to, to do a, an American trip. Depends once they, once all this COVID malarkey gets out of the way, because um, they make it so difficult to, to travel at the moment anywhere. I mean, we dropped all the re restrictions and everything in this country and just let people make their own ones up. Whereas 
lots of other countries, they, they've still got stupid rules and regulations that don't make any sense. Well, COVID anyway. really changed the world, yeah. I, I, have, I got a lot of clients because of COVID because people were reevaluating their life and wondering, you know, how could they start their own business instead of working for people? So mm. I help people um, develop uh, a business. I have one client, I'll tell you a fun little story before we go. He wanted to start a restaurant. And one of the things I do as a personal coach is I sort of dig deep and find out the reasons why you want to do what you want to do. Because mm. often what you want to do isn't really what you think you want to do. And what it came down to is that he really loved desserts. And what he really loved were chocolates. So I mm. said, well, instead of going into debt with a restaurant and spending a lot of money, why don't you open up a funky little chocolate uh, store? So he said, well, the rents are really expensive and all this stuff. And I said, well, I said, there's a florist who has a beautiful little flower store, and I bet you you could rent half of it from her. And that way it could be beautiful flowers and chocolates. And, and they just did a bit of champagne to go with it. Yeah, and we just had a blast, and people love it. They walk in, and they buy these beautiful little chocolate creations, and they get some coffee, and they walk out with a bunch of flowers. And he's doing great. And it's, it's only costing him about 2000 a month rent mm. instead of 5000 and a whole staff. He has two people helping him. That's very exciting for me to be able to take someone's idea and reshape yeah. and have them do something that's fun and funky. That sounds like a, a good scheme. It's a good thing. That's why I love helping people create their dreams like I did. Yeah. And I guess that, that, that's a, a double-edged sword because it's also helped out the, the florist. It does. She helped uh, help pay her rent, helps bring people in. And, uh, you know, if you get a little romantic thing going, you buy chocolates and flowers. Yeah. And champagne, so they just need to find and somebody. And, and some <laughs> in California, I guess it, it's easier to find somebody who's doing sparkling wine. You're not allowed to have champagne outside France, of course. Yeah, that's <laughs> like to be a lot of fun. So if any of your listeners want to get and reach reach out to me, that'd be wonderful. If I can get enough clients going in London, I'll come over there and do some workshops. Hey, happy days. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, great well, company, Tim. Thanks. No, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. The Tim Hill Podcasts. Ordinary people's extraordinary stories.